you, and uh, especially in this relatively new space. This is my first show, a uh, solo show in, in the new Boulder Street space for Kreuzer Gallery. And the last time was uh, still when uh, the, the gallery was under the bridge. It was boiling hot and we had a great time. Um, but it's been lovely to see how this, this space has taken off uh, now that it's up here. So uh, thank you for inviting me back. Thank um, you. As Abby said, my name is Claire Swinford. I am local to Colorado Springs, have been since 1998 and I uh, really started my artistic training when I, I moved back to the Springs after college in 2010. We were in the middle of a, a recession. Uh, my chosen field was ethnomusicology with an emphasis on French folk songs. <laughs> <laughs> Not a whole lot of jobs, <laughs> but I was really fortunate. I got a, a chance to uh, be an intern at the local paper, RIP The Independent, mm. and oh. uh, they stuck me on the arts and culture beat. And I immediately got to meet so many impassioned, resourceful creatives in this town who were really eager to share what they knew, what they loved, what they were trying to do to make this a better place. And I thought, wow, I would be lucky to get to be a part of this. And lo and behold, you, you, it, it, Colorado Springs is the kind of place where if you keep showing up and you show some, some willingness to, to lend your time and your talent, people are very embracing and they're willing to let you try things. And I was, I was very fortunate that one of the people who let me try things was the painter Brett Andrus. And he invited me to start coming to his gallery on Tuesday nights and learning how to paint in oil and gouache. I had never done either before. I was always the kid in school who would like uh, draw on the desks until the teacher slapped my hand and told me to stop. Um, and then eventually the teachers would see that that was the way I learned. So they would hand the, they would hand the Sharpie back and say, go for it. <laughs> but I uh, didn't really have any formal artistic training until uh, let's say 2010, 2011. Um, and from that point it was, it was off to the races. It struck something in me, I found it very meaningful. And the, that the making of the work was one half of that. And then the other half of course was showing it to people and seeing what they responded. And for the first couple of years it was like, <laughs> but I stuck with it and kept, uh, kept, kept, kept having the chance to learn from folks and get better and eventually the, I, I started seeing my work strike a chord with people and uh, the thing that delighted me most is when I, I showed people an image, I've always, my work is always centered around the, the human figure, the human face and uh, really trying to tell a story without telling the person how they should feel about what they're seeing. And the, the first time I had an exhibit, it was at the machine shop uh, back in 2015. The first time I had an exhibit where uh, I saw people start to feel things in response was, it was really, really compelling. And especially to see that people would look at the same image, two different people, and each walk away with a different story and they wanted to tell me that story. And, you know, two wildly differing uh, narratives based on the same image, that, that was really exciting to me. Um, this idea that that we can have narratively rich imagery, we can have uh, you know positions positionings of, of the human body of the natural landscape that tell someone a story, but don't necessarily tell the same story to every person. That that was what I've always found the most compelling about making about making images, or as my mentor Brett likes to say, smearing dirt on things is what we're doing here. Gouache, which is uh, what all of the paintings in this series is are, are uh, gouache paintings. Gouache is basically watercolor with chalk in it. So it's very, very uh, literally, it's, it's smearing dirt on things, uh, dirt with medium of glue and water. Um, so using those rough materials and being able to, to put together something that uh, strikes a chord in people is, is really why I do what I do. Um, I've basically all of these pieces came together uh, with one or two exceptions in the last three months. Um, and that was because I, like many artists, went through a dry spell. I, during the darkest days of the pandemic, I would see painter friends out and about in the grocery store or other places where we were still allowed to go and to gather and to, to see people. And, you know, we would ask each other, like, wow, are, are you painting? Are you okay? And the answer was, no, I'm not painting. And for, for me, that was tough to figure out because I've always thought of myself as an introvert. Like, this is this is sanctioned introvert time. I can just go down into my basement and I can just paint. 
paint a bunch, except I didn't want to, and my, my husband sitting right there, he can attest that I was a real emotional roller coaster during that time. <laughs> but uh, with, with the emergence from uh, that particular period and uh, the chance to studio somewhere that wasn't my basement, uh, that was when the shows really started to come together. Uh, and I was very fortunate that about that time, I was gifted a box of uh, old Kodak Chrome slides uh, from my mother. She knows I like to paint these. Um, she's been giving me off and on bags or boxes of, of slides through the years. And uh, this box of slides came with a suggestion. She said, she said now, sweetheart, uh, you've, you've, painted, you've painted my family a lot. Uh, a lot of my shows, uh, pieces that I've done for Abby before uh, are... Uh, pieces that fe feature my mother's family, and she said, your father has noticed that you don't paint his family. <laughs> Here. <laughs> okay, all right. We're, we're Midwesterners, that's about as confrontational as we get. So I, I took the note, uh, about half of the pieces in this show are, are images of the Swinford side, my father's side of the family, and about half are images of the Lutz side, my mother's side of the family. Both uh, hail from Iowa, all of the pieces in this show are based on photographs taken by my grandfathers, neither of whom were trained photographers in any sense of the word. Um, one of them was an auto parts salesman. The other one was um, first a machinist uh, in the Navy, a horse breaker uh, briefly, um, and a telephone lineman. So he would call my grandmother every Friday night from the top of telephone pole. Um, so guys who work with their hands, uh, but what I saw in the images that they took was something that I really wanted to get across. And it wasn't Norman Rockwell thing. It wasn't the family Thanksgiving table. It wasn't this sort of rosy American dream kind of narrative. And I mean, I respect for Norman Rockwell. He's an amazing portraitist and he had a lot more to say than most people associate with Norman Rockwell as the sort of poster on the wall uh, biographer of, of, of you know the American whatever. Uh, but that wasn't what I was trying to do in any sense of the word. What I was trying to get across was this weird thing that I saw in these uh, images that my grandfathers captured, where they were just trying to tell the story about their lives and what mattered to them. They were, they didn't even have a reference point for what is composition. Uh, they didn't really have a reference point for like, this is how you frame up a good photograph or a good image. Um, they, they were taking think, pictures of things that mattered to them, and sometimes they were awkward, and sometimes they didn't advance the film all the way, so half of the image was just orange, and you know sometimes things were framed really awkwardly, and I really tried to retain that. Um, you can see that in, in Tiny Pineapple up here. They, they cut my great-grandmother in half. <laughs> she's, she's taking a picture of, uh, I think those are her in-laws, uh, somewhere in, in uh, my grandmother says Florida, but she's 88. We can't rely on her memory. It might have been Hawaii. We don't know. But they, you know, whoever was taking the photo of her, taking the photo of them, didn't even get her all the way into the shot. But to me, that was that was a good way of, of sort of expressing the, the tension or the, the richness that I found in these images was when they don't turn out right. They're still saying something, and that something is maybe more layered and more uh, more interesting than it would have been said if everything had been framed up perfectly. Um, so trying to retain that awkwardness, uh, another one like that, that that really resonated with me and that I love is this uh, image of, you know, we think it's it's probably my, my uh, one of my great uncles here with his wife and his daughter. She's clearly going to a dance or something. Somebody's taking her picture. Uh, you know, a great uncle Dean is holding a camera. And Cousin Jim is up here on a chair, like, holding the clothesline out of the way so Paula can get her perfect shot. And I, you know, I could have framed it so that Jim wasn't in the shot, the clothesline wasn't in the shot, but I was like, no, that, that's, that's a good part of the story. Um, and sitting here in 2022, I don't even know what that story is. I had to call my mom and be like, who are these people? I don't know who they are. Um, and I don't really know what was going on here, but I, I've noticed when I put these images in front of people, Everybody has a story about them, and it's not necessarily about my family, though the point is not to, much as my aunt and my mother and her friends would like to tell you, it's not about capturing our family. Although every time I post one of these images on, on Facebook, they'll immediately say, well, that, that looks like Leona, but her hair doesn't look right. <laughs> not the point. Everybody's got an Aunt Leona. Everybody has a point of reference for, for pictures like these 
or and and sometimes that point of reference goes a lot deeper than just hey this looks like somebody I'm related to. This might tell a very different very different story depending on who's looking at it. But that was my experience of of putting putting together the show was uh, sharing these images with people and having them say like oh yeah my grandpa had a blue truck let me tell you the story about my grandpa's blue truck oh yeah. My, my family took a road trip to Arizona once, and man, yeah, that, that guy in the cowboy hat, like, let's, let's talk about that, because that resonates with me. Um, and so for, in the same way that, that some of my other bodies of work have sort of dealt obliquely with that idea of everybody sees a different story when they look at the same image, this one really tries to address that, that head-on by giving you images that are very clearly somebody's history, somebody's past. Um, but when we when we present them in a gallery format, when we you know map them and frame them and put them up on the wall, suddenly they're they're everybody's story in some way, or there might it might be a story that you haven't even fully defined for yourself yet. Um, but hopefully, looking at these these images gets you thinking and and on a deeper level than just oh that's sweet yeah we know what the '60s looked like, but if we if we reinject that that little bit of kind of not so good framing or that hey somebody's cut in half or wow we went to Helen Hunt Falls and grandma stood in front of the sign so we've got the sign and we've got grandma we can't even see the falls <laughs> like, uh, that, I, I think that 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 kind of that, that that kind of framing and that kind of story uh, really allows people to to gather around a series of images and start to have a conversation that's about more than just that idealized Rockwellian sense of the past. Um, there's, there's a quote on the wall at the beginning of my artist statement, which I've been told contains a lot of very large words. <laughs> I apologize. Um, but I would encourage you to read the quote at the top, which uh, goes something like, uh, our, our experience of everyday life is the experience of being surrounded at all times by a constant stream of ghosts. And you know, my experience with this show was contending with the ghosts of of people that I have known, some of whom are still around and some of whom are not. But in, in both cases, there's the ghost of, of who I've known them to be, the ghost of the stories that I've been told about them, and the ghost of the stories that I know I haven't heard. Um, I mentioned that Midwesterners, my, my family is kind of reticent, not known for, for putting it all out there. And so, uh, you know, my trip through my family history has been a lot of inference. That's where the that's where the word and the title of the show comes from. Is I'm I'm trying to stitch things together because there's a lot I don't know, and there's a lot that I know was was deliberately sort of pushed to the side um, in terms of in terms of my family history. And so, I, in a sense, I feel like I'm I'm viewing this as an outsider as well. Like, this might be my family, it might be anybody's family, but I'm having to sort of infer what I think is going on here. Um, and I'm having to do that through the knowledge of, of these people that I, I'm never going to know fully, but certainly don't know the way that they knew each other when these photos were taken. Uh, these are all, you know, 50, 60 years old, right? And who they were at that time is not who they are now. Um, and to me, there's there's a bittersweetness there, uh, and I apologize if I get emotional about this. Uh, a lot of these paintings are of my grandmother, my uh, maternal grandmother Claudine, uh, and Claudine Park Lutz. Uh, I visited her this past weekend. She's she's 88 now. She um, doesn't really remember things all that well, um, but I took her a, a booklet that contained uh, reproductions of all of these paintings, and I sat her down with it and said, hey, this is something something that I made, but I bet you're going to recognize a lot of these people. And there there went the finger. Oh, oh yeah, that's that's Willis. That that's my daddy. Oh, that's now that's my daughter. Yeah. You mean this daughter that's sitting right next to you right here? Yeah, that one? Oh yeah. So it but it was it was especially touching to think about like all of the different people that she has been in the course of those 88 years. And some of them are on the, the wall, and I never knew that person. Uh, the person that I knew um, was was dealing with uh, bipolar disorder. She was dealing with lifelong depression. Um, she was staunchly born again Christian to the point of really doing harm to a lot of her family members. Um, we never knew this kind of carefree, goofy, messed up hair from the wind, wearing cute little 
you know, short shorts out on a road trip. We never knew that person. Um, but that person is just a much, as much a part of her. Uh, so without getting too far into the weeds, like it just, mm -hmm. it, it, that's the constant stream of ghosts. And that's, I think, is something that a lot of people can, can relate to in terms of how they think about their own families. And so I, I hope a little bit of that comes across in the work, because uh, if we're provided a, a sort of, I, I always think art helps us think differently about the things that are hardest to wrestle with. Um, and sometimes our own families can be really hard to wrestle with. And so to me, there's a, there's a special significance to presenting the show at this time of year, um, presenting the show I, when so many of my family members are sitting here looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but pre presenting this, this show, uh, knowing that, hoping that it allows the viewer to tell, like sort of put, put their arms around the stories that they tell themselves about their family history um, and about the people who came before them and whatever that relationship looks like for you to, to be able to recognize that there is an element of narrative and there is an element of unknown and there always is going to be this squishy space where what you imagine exists on equal terms with what might, somebody else might say actually exists. Um, and I think that's a powerful space. I think that's a really creative space in which to inhabit, even when we're talking about tough things. Um, to be able to, to talk about the power of narrative and the stories that we tell ourselves. So um, that's that's the show in a nutshell. I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit about my process or hear the story about your grandfather's blue truck. <laughs> uh, I'm up for whatever. So I, I, I appreciate whatever questions my you question have. Is the, the wash, uh -huh. is the chalk also tint berry or is that all in the watercolor base? That's a, that's a wonderful question, and um, I'm going to have to go based on my experience of using that medium rather than a scientific answer. Um, but the thing that I love gouache, love about gouache is that it's more forgiving than watercolor. Watercolor, you drop it onto the page, and it is in the page, and it never goes away. And if you did the wrong thing, you just got to start over. Um, gouache, you can lay it down, and oh, crap, I put her nose in the wrong place. I'm just going to quickly wash that out and start over. So um, to, to my experience, uh, the pigment actually is in the chalk as much as it is in the base of the medium um, because it's you can you can pick it up and put it back down and folks who know more about gouache please feel free to chime in did you paint any of the figures to forget them Ooh. to erase them <laughs> that's a really good question i'll say that some some figures I've, I've painted in a certain way to try to think about them differently. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's a portrait on the on the wall that that's two very grumpy old people sitting with a very elaborate cake, and there's this little boy who looks like he's just sort of walked into the frame, um, and that little boy is my father, <laughs> and. Uh, Unmistakably, by the way. <laughs> Unmistakably. Yeah, he's, uh, God, how old is he now? He's 67 now, but uh, that, that photo was taken when he was five or six, and, and the resemblance is, is truly unsettling. Um, mm -hmm. But my, my dad and I don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, and it was, I, I, it was surprised me the degree to which it was a very meaningful experience to paint him as this small child. Mm -hmm. Um, because, I don't know, he, he was my favorite person when I was very small. Um, and I don't have, have the same feelings toward him now that I did back then. Mm -hmm. And so to get to see, get, get to see a version of him who was that small felt really meaningful. Correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy. Um, did you use the projection of slides for these compositions, or did you freehand oh, yeah. them looking, or were you were you trace were you tracing the actual projection on the on the page? I was hoping somebody would ask that. <laughs> um, so the the first couple shows where I I worked from from images, 
I, I did uh, do everything freehand. I, I gridded everything out. I would do a study. I would transfer that study to the, the surface that I wanted to use for the final painting. I would spend hours doing the line work and erasing the grid and trying to make it all work before I ever got to paint. And that I, I was working in the machine shop uh, at that point. And so there, were, I was surrounded by all of these very experienced artists and designers. And at a certain point, uh, Troy DeRose comes in and he goes, you know, we have a projector in the conference room. <laughs> and and I, I think I said something like, no, but I want to do this the hard way. I want to do this the real way. And he was like, why? <laughs> painting is the fun part. Spend more time on the painting. Um, so he, he really gave me sort of the, the permission to, to uh, use projection and tracing for, for my line work. And um, I had this whole like defensive spiel about how like I've studied the anatomy and I've done a bunch of figure figure drawing classes, so it's not like I'm just you know tracing it like it's a you know paint by numbers, but you know, it's it's a way of, of quickly noting down the relationship of the things that I want to paint so that I can spend more time actually applying paint to canvas or in this case paint to paper. So I, I do trace. Uh, I, I use a, a series of uh, very old projectors. Um, two of which burned out in the course of making this show. So it was like a hope and a prayer. Am I gonna burn out my last antique light bulb before this show is done? Um, and it lasted. <laughs> yeah. I, get, I get hilarious phone calls. <laughs> yeah. Then I have to try and talk quite seriously. And then, and then he looks up the, the light bulbs on Amazon and he says, they're $150 a pop. Can you think of any other way to get this done? Um, but uh, yeah, RIP the the electrical parts store on Fillmore that yeah, had right. every other thing mm -hmm. under the sun because that was that was where my stash of light bulbs came from and it's no longer there. So. But I do think that there's something lovely about um, about using light as the first medium for a work. Uh, the, I, I think it definitely plays with your sense of color. I think it plays with um, your sense of. Uh, the relationships of the objects, uh, and, and a lot of that transparency makes its way into the work, which is a quality that I really like. Um, I mean, so, some of my favorite pieces, I really laid the paint on thick, but I, I really, especially when I paint faces, I like leaving that, that sense of translucency or almost illumination from within, because um, I think it gives a, a sort of life um, or a sense, it's kind of a sense of immediacy to, to the people that I'm painting. Um, I never like a face as much if I put too much paint on it. Um, so I, I would say the, the portrait of the, the four people in front of the Chinese lion statue over here is probably the, the piece where I felt like I accomplished that the best, where I really got the, the, like, the faces look like what they need to look like, but there's not a whole lot of paint there. There, there aren't too many layers. Um, and so working, working with light first really allows me to sort of see that sense of, of the face and of the of the objects uh, before I get going and I try to retain that as much as possible which is how I burned all, out all those bulbs is because mm -hmm. I wanted to just keep looking at the projected image the whole time while I was painting mm -hmm. which also is a nice way to enforce breaks if you've got to let the projector cool off you've got time to go make yourself a cup of tea or whatever. <laughs> Do you know the name of the photographer? Was it one photographer who did all <sighs> Dick? And Wilton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so Dick at the beach there. Uh, that's probably the only uh, the only piece that had to be taken by another member of the Lutz family because otherwise mm -hmm. he is the photographer. And there's there's a family joke about how both uh, both of the grandfathers really like taking pictures of cars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes with no people on them, like the car, the family car shows up in the vacation album for every single road trip. Mm -hmm. um, just the car by itself. Um, so uh, this this is another Dick original where you know like he, he just took a portrait of his car in his driveway, but there's all these layers of like this is the first like prefab house I got to just buy, and this the, this is one of the first cars that I just got to like buy new off the lot, and there's there's a lot of like pride um, in in that image to me because uh, of where the family had been previously, uh, and certainly for. Um, the images of, of the, the other side of the family, the, the little boy and the two very grumpy people, like most of those were my paternal grandfather who always had a knack for pressing the shutter at the wrong time. 
Uh, so that's what we see with a lot of these photos, including the one of the, the bridal party where you can't really tell where the woman is in the dress. Is she, <laughs> did she trip? Uh, is she like dissolving in tears? What's going on here? It's not a great image. Like uh, that, that was not grandpa's forte, but uh, this, this was a way of, of telling a story about where they were in their lives. And that was, that was the reason these images were taken is so they could be shared around with others, uh, not any kind of self-expression, if you will. Yeah, Chris. So yeah, talking about the cars makes me wonder, yeah, first of all, who would even take pictures of bicycles or skateboards or anything like that? I don't even know. <laughs> oh, um, I don't know anybody but, like that. But yeah, what type? It's really easy to look at all the uh, personalities and say, oh, that's the memory. That's where the memory resides. Did you see any objects that really just made you think, I forgot all about that? And that storytelling brings back a person that's maybe not represented, anything like that? A little bit. Um, and actually, this isn't even like my memory, but it was a memory that, that several other members of my family like immediately recalled. Um, so this, this image that's all the way on the left-hand side here uh, of the two figures on the beach, um, that, that was my... I, <laughs> The, the two figures are my mother and my grandfather. And I show that, I show that one to my 88-year-old 88 88 grandmother and she immediately goes, oh yeah, and those, those bikinis, that was the year that we all got bikinis. Cause, cause you know, Fred had, that's her brother, had been in Vietnam and he got sent to Hawaii on R&R &R, and he brought us all back bikinis. <laughs> I didn't know that, but my grandmother immediately latched onto that memory, and then I come to find out that the person who bought that painting is my aunt's wife, and it's a surprise for her for Christmas, because that beach trip was one of her happiest childhood memories. Um, that was nothing that I knew, I just knew like, oh, I get to paint this tiny little swimsuit, and why, why the heck am I painting these figures that are only half an inch tall, this is the worst, uh, but it, you, the object immediately sparked this, this whole thing. Uh, and I had no idea until I shoved it under the noses of, of the people I was related to. Um, I did work with a really limited palette uh, for this for this series, uh, and I pre-treated all of all of the pieces uh, after I got the initial sketch down. I did do a wash of um, a very very light wash of the kind of ready reddish brown color that you see uh, expressed in the bottom of that painting. So every single one of those one of these paintings has a light wash of that color as its first layer. Um, and I did that not necessarily to match uh, the, pa the, the palette that I was seeing in the uh, original slides, but to give it a little bit of that, that aged quality, um, to, give, to give all these pieces a, a sense of unity. And I, I just, I don't like working on a white ground because I think it makes, make, makes things a little, a little too sterile. Um, there's one piece in this show where I forgot to lay down that uh, that burnt sienna ground first. I'm not going to tell you which one it is. But <laughs> there's there's one piece where I forgot to do that, and I can I could I could see in the in the finished work because um, it didn't quite have that same quality. Um, but what I what I try to do when I when I mix colors is um, most of most of my uh, very uh, Caucasian family, I, I, I use burnt sienna and then like a, a sort of wine purple color for just about every single, you know, contour and flesh tone. Um, occasionally I'll add in a teensy bit of brown if I, if I really want to hit a shadow, but it's, it's mostly orange and purple because um, I think that gives a certain vibrancy to it. Um, and I really try to uh, bump up contrast because uh, so to me, I, I really enjoy this, this sense of sort of like falling into a painting, like there's some depth there. Um, and if I can really hit my darks really dark um, and then leave some places really light and ethereal and translucent, then, then the resulting image tends to have more richness for me. So like um, this one, uh, which it's called Glenn, Bess, and Dog, and then my dad texted me to tell me, no, that's Hugh, Mildred, and Chili. <laughs> so I'm making another one that we're going to call Hugh, Mildred, and Chili, but uh, this is Glenn, Bess, and Dog. Uh, but the, this is this is a piece where I feel like I really I really hit it right, um, where I've got this sort of dark, velvety uh, green in the background, and then I've got this this really 
sort of translucent sun-washed quality to, to the faces. Um, that's, that's probably the best expression of what I want each of my pieces to have in, in terms of, of color and value. Thank you, Claire, for sharing with us. Yeah.